Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiecka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiecka. It seems like everywhere we go, we're confronted with chaos and upheaval. Given this doesn't look like it'll change anytime soon, where do we find peace within it? Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network, exedbn.net. With us this hour to explore finding peace in a world of chaos is Don Johnson. Don, the author of Living a Conscious Life, is a former monk and business leader turned writer and executive coach. His spiritual quest began as a college student and led him on a 10-year journey where he lived in ashrams and taught meditation in North America, Europe, Africa, and Australia. In his 30s, he left the ashram, started a family, and a career in the leadership and development industry, where he provided training and coaching to leaders in Fortune 500 companies. His website, integrigroup.com, integrigroup.com. Don, thank you so much for joining us on Mission Evolution. Thank you, Gwilda. Very happy to be here with you. (laughs) You're all the way over there in Scotland, aren't you? That is true. The Northeast Northeast Coast. Nice. I wish I was there. (laughs) Sounds lovely. Sounds lovely. It can be. (laughs) And then it has moments like every place else. You got it. (laughs) I understand you were a monk. How did you go from there to being in the leadership industry? Oh, how did I do that? Well, when one leaves the confines of being a monk, uh, one discovers quickly that uh, there's bills to pay, there's life, there's a career, there's, there's the big world out there. So honestly, it was happenstance. It was one little thing after another. I left the ashram. I sold telephone systems in Miami door to door. Then I moved to Philadelphia. I got lucky. And after hundreds of of turned down resumes and such, I got a job teaching sales training at a bank. And then somebody offered me a interview at a really wonderful U.S. based leadership and development company. And somehow I convinced them to hire me. Why? I, I don't exactly know, but I got in the door. And how long were you there? That particular company I worked for from 1988 to 2004. So it was a good run. Yes. So it, was. Yeah. it was a good run. And I started out as a consultant and I went into sales and I became a general manager and a, like a VP of a, of a region of a business unit. And uh, it was quite a journey. And it was, I learned a lot and a lot happened for me. It was really quite amazing. I was very fortunate. So from a monk to leadership and development, Who are you really? (laughs) Yeah. Who am I really? Well, you know, what I realized when I lived in the ashram was that um, my mission at that time was to know myself more, was to really uncover who am I really on the inside and not my thoughts, not my ideas and so on, but how can I get in touch with my essence? And uh, that was that was why I didn't really want to become a monk, but there's another story to that. But that's the way it wound up. But the mission that I was on was I want to find inner peace. I want to do my part in bringing bringing goodness into the world and so on. So who am I? My roots my roots go deep in the fact that I'm I'm a human being trying to be a better human being, and you know I'm working from the inside out. I that's the way I, I look at it. So I think, you know, one part of me is sure. I'm like a searcher. I'm a seeker. I'm a, I'm a believer in, in those things. And, you know, I'm many other things too, just like all of us, you know, a husband, a parent, a father, you know, et cetera. But, um, you know, I'm my, my mission is like, how, how can I bring more goodness into the world? Really? That's- I like the way you say it from the inside out. Um, does that have to do with, of course, a lot of introspecting, but does it have to do with healing and reframing a lot? 
for me, it did. Um, when I came out of the ashram, I was very um, out of balance. The um, <laughs> psychotherapist that I wound up, a Jungian psychotherapist that I was introduced to, and we had an initial, an initial chat, and he said, well, here's my analysis of you. He said, you've got a uh, lover inflation, you've got a warrior depletion, and you've got a mis- magician leakage. So that was based on the work of Robert Moore, Douglas Gillette in their book, The King, the Warrior, the Lover, Magician. So uh, basically he said, you're, you know, you're all screwed up and uh, let's, um, uh, you know, if you want to work with me, here's my first question for you. How's your relationship with your father? And I said, terrible. And we began to do the work. So the work for me was unpacking, you know, some childhood wounds and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, I continue to, you know, to work on that. And that's, you know, what I continue to do. I, I, I just believe that if we're going to be more whole, we've got to be willing to do, you know, do the inner work. And that work continues to this very day. I'm still doing it. You know, I'm, I'm, over the years, I've certainly noticed that there's the people that do the inner work and then teach from there. And there's the people that think they can teach without doing the inner work. And there's no comparing the two. Ooh, yeah, I would I would uh, I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> So how did your time as a monk shape your understanding of consciousness and personal growth? Mm, Well, um, you know, um, I would say the way it shaped it was I understood that um, there is a there is a quiet place within us. And uh, I was fortunate enough to learn some techniques, ancient techniques that, you know, simply take our energy or focus from going outside and turn it within. And um, I began to appreciate the fact that what this did was it gave me a lot of joy, gave me a lot of happiness. And I also realized that I could actually live with very little. I mean, I lived with, you know, I was, I took vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. So for 10 years, I had, I made no money. I had no, you know, foreseeable future in terms of a career. I didn't really understand how that was all going to shake out, but nevertheless, I had that appreciation for a higher consciousness. And, you know, I think it really gave me a foundation of appreciation for life and for the good things in life. And also appreciation of that. I really don't need all that much to be happy. Um, And I learned to live with very little and behind me on the bookshelf, I've got two binders that are about that thick letters that I'd written to my mother and father when I was in the ashram for 10 years basically telling them you should try this too it's really good and and i'm i'm just i'm you know i'm happy as a, a pea in a pot i know you're worried about me that i joined a cult which turns out i did but that's another story but nevertheless i was quite i was quite happy so it just you know i think it just shows us that you know the things that we look for the peace that we look for and people places and things yeah, we can get temporary peace and some joy from that for sure. But lasting wholeness, lasting peace, it's somewhere else and it's not out there. So the access point is within? I think so. What do you think? <laughs> I'd have to agree. Yeah, I think the access, I think it starts there. I think, you know, and peace means a lot of things to a lot of different people, let's face it. And, um, and you know, what I realized over the years was just because I do meditation, does not mean I'm going to find lasting peace in my life. That became very clear to me over time. I think originally I thought that in my, in my youth, but as I got older, I realized, no, you got to do the inner work. You got to clean up the stuff that gets in our way every day, the triggers, the wounds, the projections, all that stuff that you're familiar with. Did you find that meditation helped you access those very things? I mean the dark side Mm -hmm. or the good, the, the, um, the wounding, all this stuff yeah, needs to be cleared. Um, not in those early years, to tell you the truth. I think it was more of a, um, I think I got very overly focused on that because, you know, when I came out, I think I was very, as a young man, I went in at 23, came out at 33. Those are 10 years of important development in terms of psychological development, emotional development, development in relationships. Um, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that young people do what I did because I came out very, um, I had to do, I had a lot of catching up to do, Wilda. 
how did you go about doing that catch up? I mean, I think we all at this point have a lot of catch up to do because things are moving so quickly. Um, uh, how, yeah. how, how'd, how'd you initiate that for yourself? Um, you know, I think it started out with the, with the therapy and uh, unpacking some of the, some of that childhood stuff. Um, I think uh, immersing myself in the business world was another way to um, realize what I knew and what I didn't know and accept, you know, I, I think I really had to face the fact that um, if I was going to kind of do the catching up, I, I needed to read, I needed to study, I needed to be open-minded, I needed to um, investigate things that I had never paid attention to before. And I'm doing all this while I'm now, you know, struggling to survive, raising a family. So, I mean, it was a scramble. Well, I mean, it was, I felt like I was scrambling and, and scrabbling, you know, uphill for quite a number of years. I can imagine. We're about out of time in this segment, but did you um, continue your meditation practice uh, throughout that scrambling time? I did. I did, actually. Um, I certainly wasn't doing two hours a day like I was when I lived in the, you know, shelter of an ashram, which is, ashram means shelter in Hindi. But I did, uh, I did my best to try to get a little bit in every day, particularly in the morning. Yeah. And well, I, continue, I continue to do so today. So It's that magic moment. Don and I will return very shortly. So don't you go away. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. I hear a lot about consciousness. What is it? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us this, this hour discussing consciousness is Don Johnson. Don is the author of Living a Conscious Life. Don, there is the $64 question. What is consciousness? What is consciousness? <clears throat> for me, um, for me, consciousness is being present, paying attention, um, being in the moment, observing, be the observer of your thoughts, of your feelings, noticing, paying attention. Consciousness, I think, is being awake. Um, and, uh, you know, the more that we stay awake, I think the more we can learn, the faster we can grow. But I think consciousness is that energy that sustains us and is always in the moment. There's always, you know, life is wonderful in the moment. It's when we go in the future. It's when we go in the past that things get crazy. And uh, so I think consciousness is that is that being a, that ability to be in the moment. Being in the moment that, you know, it sounds so simple, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think most of us don't even recognize that we're not. OK, I, I had gone to a retreat at one point. It had been a long retreat. It was up in Canada at a mm. lovely resort, not a resort, but a, a mm. place off off grid and everything. And we spent, you know, two weeks just really immersed in spiritual stuff. And I I went to the airport then to, to fly home and. I looked around and I was the only one present. Somebody's tapping her foot and she's talking on the phone. She's saying, I'm going to miss my flight. I'm, you know, the flight's late. I'm going to miss my second, you know, so she's clear out there. And then people behind me were saying goodbye. That's before you could, had to go, you know, stop at, at customs there before you could yeah. go on. You had to have a ticket. And so they were in the past. Oh my gosh, you know, it was so good. I, I don't want to leave, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I really, I looked around me and I swear there was nobody present. I felt quite blown. <laughs> And I think that that continues. Um, yeah. How can we tell that we're not present? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. How do you tell you're not present? Um, you probably can't. You know, it's probably hard because I think you you drift. You don't know. You know, you get lost in your thoughts. Um, and I think that's why, you know, the spiritual practice practices teach like, well, how do you return to present? And, you know, one of the techniques that I use is the, the power of the breath. And the amazing thing about the breath is that, you know, the, our lungs are involuntary and a voluntary muscle. So we don't have to think about breathing. But when you, when, you, when you connect with your breath, you're always in the present because the breath is always in the present. So one way to see if you're present or not is to say, are we even aware that we're breathing? I mean, I mean, I think we all know that you know, we, we, I mean, we wander off all the time. We wander, we lose, we lose present moment awareness all the time. I don't know anybody that's totally present aware all the time. I don't know. Maybe they are. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I think you, I think you catch yourself in your thoughts. And when I notice I'm, I'm thinking, 
I go, oh, that's interesting. And then I'm also checking to see, am I even aware of the present moment? Am I breathing? So, you know, like you say, a lot of us don't even recognize um, that we're not in the present. How much does that have to do with, you know, we're, 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 worrying about what happened in our past where we've got damage and we're afraid of the future because we have damage. How much does it have to do with being wounded? I mean, where we live, like how much, how much time we spend elsewhere, how much time we spend present, you know, or being unable to be present. How much does yeah. it have to do with our woundedness? Maybe it does. Um, you know, I mean, the, you know, the philosophy or the theory I have is that um, when we lack connection, to ourselves first, um, we, we, we drift. And, you know, you probably know this and our listeners know that a great deal of trauma, you know, originates from a lack of connection or addiction. And uh, so, again, um, I've seen many people turn their lives around when they begin to become more present and they look at some of the dark stuff and they kind of recognize it and they accept it and they start working with it. But they make an effort, you know, to bring themselves to, to do practices and to con, like to, ser- to seek well-being and to search for that oasis that can be the, the healer to a lot of the of the trauma. So I think it's around connection that helps us, you know, heal and be more present. Connection and I think, with connection with ourselves and others. Yeah, connection with ourselves and others. I mean, community is important. Uh, really important for for people to be healthy, I believe. Yeah, I think it's tough for people to live by themselves. I really do. You um, um, spent a lot of time every day, three hours, I think you said, meditating, mm-hmm. using these practices, mm-hmm. and yet you ended up unprocessed and um, lost. Yep. What, what's what, what was what's, the cause of that? I mean, it sounds like you were doing all the right stuff, according well, to a lot of people. Well, you know, here's here's what I say now. I say now that meditation is not the most important spiritual practice. Okay. That's what I say. I say, <laughs> I say you can chase the light all day that you, you can chase the light all day long, but if you don't confront and deal with your darkness, you're going to get stuck somewhere. So I was out of balance. I mean, that was, you know, the living, living in a, um, a, a Hindi influenced ashram, was a place where the focus was purely on the spiritual. It wasn't on the psychological, it wasn't on the emotional. And that's problematic in my book. Did it end up being kind of like an escape rather than dealing? I believe in hindsight, yes. Interesting. So balance in all things. Hmm. Balance. I think you're absolutely right. Balance is the key. So, Don, what does it mean to live a conscious life? For me, what it means, it means um, means a couple things. Uh, Living conscious life is making an effort to be present, to be self-aware, to understand your own inner world, to manage your own inner stuff, and to have the emotional intelligence to manage the social situation that you're in, to understand what it needs what the audience, read the audience, so to speak, and respond, you know, appropriately. Um, And I think living a conscious life is, you know, signing up for the fact that you're not always going to be conscious and that you're going to learn through failure and how to accept failure. I think another part of living a conscious life is to develop self-love and self-care and to be, you know, more kind and forgiving, you know, to yourself. If you're one of those people like me that was very hard on myself. So I'm, finding that that's more and more important as I've gotten older is the concept of self-love, self-care, forgiveness. It seems like when we're unprocessed Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't dug into the dark shadows and and done a lot of that work, Mm -hmm. that we don't hear even what's being said to us. It's, it's all is a knee jerk reaction to a trigger versus what's happening in the present moment. Mm-hmm. How can we work around that? What, or maybe there isn't a workaround. How, how do we first start to tackle that? How do you tackle that? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I experienced was if you, if you go with your darkness and you go down that path, eventually, I mean, for me, I was, it was, 
uh, how would I say this? Eventually, I realized that it was bad for me, but I didn't realize it for a number of years. And it wasn't until I was humiliated by someone and I looked and they called me out on my behavior. And then I looked at that and I said, oh, my God. Do I want to live like this? Do I want to have that kind of reputation in the world? And then, then that was the beginning of the hard work. That's the beginning of the prayer. That was the beginning of really calling out to the universe saying, I really need help. I don't know if I can do this on my own. I've tried and I failed. But when I turned and opened my heart to the universe and prayed and really asked for help, the universe delivered. But I had to be I had to pay attention to the guides and the mentors and the omens and the signs. And without doing that, I don't I think I would have missed the boat. So that's the, that was my that was my way of doing it. I think everybody probably has their own way. But that was what started it for me, if that makes sense. It does, because I like the way you said it was someone that called you out on something. If we are chasing our shadow and we're, you know, living in a in a vacuum if you will we don't have much mm-hmm. around us and as far as conscious people that'll call us out thank mm-hmm. you um we can just kind of brew in our own juices and never move forward can't we you know, those juices and oftentimes those juices feel really good because it's cozy you know it's cozy in our own little cocoon you know our own little world and we make up stories and we live in false beliefs and we think actually i can i can deal with this i can it's not so bad but these, this is just complete, it's complete fabrication. That's what I found. I, I made up a story. I lied to myself. And eventually I realized, wow, that's just, that is bad juju. Don't we lie to ourselves to keep from looking at where we feel we're lacking? Probably so. Mm-hmm. It's painful. But, but, then we can't, but then we can't ever fix it, right? If then, we're, if then, we're, if we're then, avoided. then you get stuck. So, yeah, I think it takes a lot of bravery and courage when to, you know, to face the, the parts of ourselves that are that we don't really like, you know, and um, that's part of the work, I think, isn't it? A large majority, I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're about to go into another uh, commercial break, but mm-hmm. um, when we come back, I'd really like to talk about relationship and how it has to be such a balance. You know, like I said, you can stew in your own juices and create your own yeah. reality, right? If yeah. you don't have outside input. Sound Beautiful. like a fun place to go? Cool. Let's <laughs> do it. Don and I will be right back to continue this discussion. So please stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. We're coming to you on the Exxon Broadcast Network, net. Is seeing believing... Or is believing seeing? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us discussing the impact of personal perception is Don Johnson. His website, integriagroup.com. Don, let's start with that that question because it's we were talking about how we create our own reality of avoidance and lies. Um, and so then we're seeing what we've created. But mm-hmm. is it true? Um, mm-hmm. how, how much does, what's perception? How does perception play in here? <laughs> That's a great one, yeah. No, I love the, this idea of perception. Uh, you know, we I think we look through lenses. We look through glasses. And we look through our beliefs. Beliefs are like a window, like a clear window. And when we have a belief, we look through that belief at the world. And when things match up with our beliefs, we feel good. We feel like, ah, we're, we're in good company. But when we look through those beliefs and we see people different, differing with us, or we see information that's contrary to our beliefs, that's when it gets a little tough. That's when it gets challenging. So what I what I find is that, you know, I see things the way that I see them. You see them the way that you see them. And we don't see the world the same way. We're wired differently. And this is something that's just, this is human nature. And so the question then becomes, am I willing to open myself to differing points of view? Can I respect a different point of view? Can I appreciate differences? Can I change my beliefs? Can I even, do I even understand what my beliefs are? And sometimes I don't think we even know that we're looking through beliefs. We get so used to them. 
with each of us having a different reality, basically, mm-hmm. that does doesn't that um, form the tapestry of life? Really, all these d- divergent but similar uh, views doesn't doesn't the differences isn't that part of what gives us depth perception? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, I think the I think the problem comes when I try to impose my beliefs on you, and I expect you to subscribe to my way of thinking. And I don't get curious about why you think the way that you think. So that leaves us with, we, we don't have a jigsaw puzzle. We have spaces between the pieces, right? Because mm-hmm. we're, we're unwilling to meet. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's, and that's, I think that's where, that's where there's, that's where breakdowns come from is the unwillingness to enter into dialogue and the unwillingness to be curious. One of the things that I, wrote about in an article I wrote some time ago is what's what's wisdom begins with one question, which is what don't I know? And when I worked at a particular company, my boss said to me, I want you to get to know this guy that lives in another country and you two guys need to work together to help us achieve some of our goals. I said, okay. So I got on the phone with him and somehow it just came to me. I said, Paul, why don't we just talk about what we don't know about each other as a way to build the relationship? And that's the way it began. And he and I then developed a very strong relationship. But here's the thing. Until I did that, I had a negative opinion about him. And then when we opened that conversation up to what don't I know, sort of the veil was lifted. And then I realized, wow. He's much more than I thought he was. He's a much better man than I thought he was. Yeah, we can't, we, we can't, uh, I like to say the window, the light is only clear as the window through which it shines. If we're really stuck in our beliefs that we're looking through, yeah. that leaves us no flexibility to see another le- level of truth. Is, is that part, part of what was going on for you? Abs- absolutely. You know, absolutely. I got, you got, I got stuck. You know, we, we form is, you know, you know this, we form an impression about someone within the first couple of seconds. And then we then we judge, you know, from there on in, we, we, we look, we look for them to behave in a certain way. You know, look at, you know, look at families, sometimes in family, there's a black sheep in the family, then there's a family gathering, some people then have a preconceived notion of they're looking for the black sheep to make the mistake to act out. And they're just, that's what they look for because that's their frame of reference. That's their lens, you know, and it's, it's tragic because sometimes we don't give people a chance to like be who they are, or we think people can't grow and change, but they so we, we all can. We basically interpret their behavior through that lens and make it a black sheep activity, Correct. whether it is or not. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. How, how much do you think this, um, desperately clinging to our viewpoint has to do with fear and um, self self loathing actually. Yeah. You know, um, I use this model where it's like on a continuum and on, and the model is something like on one far end of the continuum, there's humility. And on the other end of the continuum, there's arrogance and you can, you can overdo both too. You know, you can overdo humility and be passive and you can overdo arrogance and be brutally arrogant, but there's some place in the middle, and that's the middle. The middle is that place of being open to other people's ideas and 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 and, and learning, and at the same time, being willing to stand in your own truth and express your own opinion, and express it clearly, and have a mutual back and forth. But I think it's the Going to the extremes is where we get into trouble. Too passive, too aggressive, but there's a middle path. And aren't we polarized and in trouble right now? I mean, as a society, it seems like we we look for people to agree with us, which makes us more polarized towards our viewpoint, right? Uh, Absolutely. We, you know, we see it in in the United States and other countries as well. But yeah, it's very polarizing. You know, if you put your views out there and uh, on social media, and if people don't agree with you, you get attacked. But if you put your views out there and somebody agrees with you, well, then life is good. You know? and, and yet we put our views out there because we want people to agree with us. 
You know, we don't have we don't have people. Our, our good friends are generally not people who vehemently disagree with us. We choose those friends so that we get to feel like we have a community of people that think like us. And that's you know this is this becomes dangerous. I can certainly see that, and it's like the true friend <laughs> is the one that's not afraid to disagree. There you go. Isn't that <laughs> isn't that well said? That's very um, alchemical, really, isn't disagreement kind of alchemical? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we seem to be living in times of major change, upheaval. What do you see as promoting this uh, current mayhem? <laughs> wow. What's promoting the current mayhem? Um, uh, well, I think... Um, you know, you mentioned something earlier about fear, and um, one of the characteristics of uh, this this notion of um, we want to look good and be right. We want to. It's a. I think it's a fear-based mechanism of of being wanting to find security, and um, it's limiting. And it's the you know if we reference Carol Dweck's work around, you know, you know, closed mindset, growth mindset, you know, we see that when, it, when, you, when we have a closed mindset, we don't open ourselves to learning. We refuse, we refuse facts and rationale, even if they could be proven, because we do, it, it challenges our, our self-identity of, of who we think we are. But much of the time, who we think we are is not really who we really are. You know, we're not our thoughts. We're not our ideas. But until we, you know, go to a deeper level, all that stuff gets us into trouble. So we dig in and we hunker down. And I think we see a lot of hunkering down right now. And a lot of it's, you know, self-preservation of, you know, we're afraid that if the other side takes over, we're going to suffer. It seems that the polarization, um, there's being increasing pressure put on it. It seems like we're moving towards a time of unification uh, mm -hmm. overall. And so it's it would not appear <laughs> to be as easy to stick your head in the sand and, and polarize as it was historically. Do you think this is causing a certain level of desperation? You mean the polarization? No, the uh, inability to... Uh, <laughs> remain polarized uh, as we're moving more towards unity well i think i think there's a lot of light coming into the world right now and i think there's a lot of light energy and a lot of belief a lot of belief in the goodness as we pass through these dark times so to speak so i'm not the, i'm not the person sitting here going oh this is the this is the worst time to live or anything like that i'm looking at this as I am so grateful to be here at this time because I see I see the light building and I see the opportunity to um, because more people are waking up. That's what I that's I mean, that's the world that I live in. Maybe I'm full of it, you know, but my glass, I, I've I've always been an optimist. I'm, that's the way I look at it. And um, and I spend time with people that are thinking this way, too. And I and I see their commitment to making the world a better place and and going through this thought going through this like not getting sucked into the polarization is what i'm saying well the increasing light is increasingly showing the shadow isn't it so is that causing yes, some is. of the disruption uh, while we go through this time i i think there's a fight i think you're absolutely on it um you know and i think this is the challenge i think um when one goes for the light, one has to also be ready to deal with the darkness too. I think Carl Jung had a great saying in his in his book when uh, he called uh, he he met one of his friends and he was very well aware that when good things happen, the the shadows really right there ready to take credit or whatever. And I think you probably know the saying, which is Carl Jung would ask one of his friends, "Have you had any terrible successes lately?" <laughs> I love that one. Isn't it great? Well it's, it's time, though, however, for us to take another station break. Please stay with us as Don and I continue to explore finding consciousness 
in a seemingly unconscious world. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Where can we find peace? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Don Johnson. His website, Integria Group, excuse me, integriagroup.com. Don, where can we find peace? I mean, um, it seems like it's in, in short supply right now. Hmm. Where can we find it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I start my day, even though I'm, you know, like I said, I'm a meditator and I visualize and I set myself up for the day on my intentions. How do I want to live my life this day? And that's, you know, that's a, that's an act of trying to be present and saying, how can I go through this day trying to be the best that I can be and make a contribution? So for me, it's, it starts, you know, in how I wake up and, and what I put my sight on for that particular day. But that, that's the, that's the, that's the place I start. But, you know, we go through the day and the winds blow, things happen. You know, we, maybe we get blown off course. Um, I have to be willing to recover. I have to be willing to admit that I might be wrong, that I might not see the whole picture. Oftentimes that's a big, big deal. Is just to realize that every story is incomplete, you know, and the, and the brain wants to complete the story. The brain wants to fill in the gaps and wants to make that, make it nice and neat and tidy, like figure it all out. But there's so much we can't, we don't know. You know, I think my grandfather used to say, there's my story, there's your story, and there's the fly on the wall story. So, you know, and if, and if I adopt that attitude of openness and learning, that's, that's the avenue toward peace, you know, because then I'm able to weather some of these little bumps. But if I get all hung up on them and get myself wrapped around the axle about how I think things should be, I will suffer. But I think peace comes from realizing we're not in control of everything, except maybe how we show up, what we, the words we choose to say, how we behave. Uh, but I have to will. I have to be willing to be wrong, and I have to be willing to learn. And that's what I've found as I've gotten older. There's more peace in having that mindset, perhaps, than anything else. I heard one time this uh, saying that, you know, an airplane. This is an actual fact. An airplane takes out off from DIA, and they file a flight plan, and they're going to LAX. Okay, and they're on that flight plan plan less than 10% of the time. They deviate for weather, they deviate for traffic, okay, but they end up landing at, at LAX. <laughs> so it's a matter of this constant course correction, isn't it? I think it is. I think it is. Like how we, how we kind of manage the, the little moments, when, and life is full of these little moments. Um, how do I catch myself a little bit sooner? That's one of the things I judge myself on these days. Like, how am I doing on the whole path, you know, kind of a thing. And I think, well, you know, it's not like I stay on the path all the time. It's can I catch myself a little bit sooner when I, you know, when I go off on somebody, when I say something that is, isn't appropriate or, or when I, you know, that, that to me is like a good sign of I'm catching myself just a little bit sooner when I get into trouble. That's all we can do. I would, I would expect. <laughs> so, um, I hope, yeah. you know, how can curiosity and listening help build a better word, world? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I touched on a little bit of this before, but I think, I think curiosity and humility, like our best friends, they go together. And um, you know, when I, I have, you know, different. Like, here's here's an example. When I. A guy came to my house some years ago. He sat in the room that, I, that I'm in right now. And I think he talked at me for about 45 minutes. And he didn't ask me one question. And I sat there later and I thought, wow. And it was really, I thought, why didn't I feel connected? Well, basically I was on the other end of a monologue, really. <laughs> and then I met somebody shortly thereafter. And there was this back and forth. There was this almost like we were playing catch. The conversation was like 
playing catch with a ball. He threw it at me, I threw it at him. And there was this beautiful dance. And I felt at the end of the conversation, I thought, I just want to spend more time with that guy. And he was curious. I, and I had a certain amount of curiosity too. I don't always have that amount. Sometimes I can be arrogant, but in that, in that, in that setting, it's like, this is the dance. This is, this is where curiosity, you know, comes in. How does it make a better world? Sure. It makes a better world because we feel more connected. You know, we feel, we don't feel put down. We don't feel judged. We don't feel isolated. We feel like we're in this together because we talk and we listen. And I think those things are so, so, so important today. It's about that time of the show, Don, when I get to ask you, what's your mission? Uh -huh. What's my person, my personal mission? My personal mission is how can I make the world a little better place by my own behavior and about making a contribution to the betterment through whatever work I do, whether it's my coaching or writing or a consulting work. Um, I'm trying to leave people with a smile. I'm trying to help people realize that they have so much within them and there's many ways to tap into that. But I, I'm, I, my mission is that's, that's, that's what I have on my, my vision board. It's like, I want to create value. I want to be of service. I want to do work that's fun. I want to do, do work that helps people um, enrich their lives. So that's my mission. It's a beautiful one. Thank you. So let's go to community. What's the importance that you see of community at this time? I can tell you what it means to me. And, uh, you know, I, I left the U.S. five years ago. Um, I left a, uh, I left a second marriage. I left my home. I left my kids. I moved to Scotland. And I didn't know anybody except my wife and then, you know, maybe a couple of friends. And what happened to me since then is um, I've developed a community of people and friends. And that was because I got out and about. I made an effort to join groups, to find my, find my way and, and, and become part of what I, what my, what I was surrounded by. But what I also realized is I can find community by walking down the street, by saying hello to the, the person behind the, the register at a, at a coffee shop and asking them how they're doing or smiling at them or making a, a, a conversation. And I feel like I build community by how I show up and I do it and I try to do it wherever I go. And it, you know what, it makes me feel connected to the world around me, to my environment. And I feel like I'm a part of it. And uh, so when you feel a, a part of your environment, you take care of your environment. And that's, also answers my next question of building a more conscious and connected community. <laughs> you have to connect, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to do something, you know, and, and, uh, and it doesn't take, you know, it's not rocket science to, to be nice to someone, a stranger, to ask somebody how they're doing, to ask someone how you can help. It's not, these are not big things. We can all do this stuff. And if you've been on the receiving end of that, it's like, whoa, that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I watch so, people just light up when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Don, what do you mean by living from the heart? Yeah, for me, um, I think it's um, looking for how do I bring, how do I bring love and kindness, you know, into my everyday life? And that means in how I, what I write, what I say, um, how I treat people. Um, you know, I had an argument with a guy the other day. I'll give you an example. And uh, um, I, I'm not saying I'm particularly proud about this. I think I could have handled it a bit better. But in the heat of the moment, um, we were supposed to operate as a team playing a, a match together, a tennis match. And um, he just in my opinion, just was over dominating and telling me this and telling me that. And I said, can I help you? He said, no, he just said, I don't want your help and this and that. And finally, I just said, you know, I'm not sure we can be a team. And I just, I just kind of had to draw a boundary and say, I don't think we're compatible. And I thought the words are coming out of my mouth. And I thought, 
I can't believe I'm doing this. Like generally, I never say no to people. I'm no, more of like, I'll find a way to work this out. Anyway, at the end of the whole thing, I said, look, I said, we disagree, but let's shake hands and part as friends. I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't need, I don't want you to be my enemy. That's not the point. You know, you're a nice guy, but I don't want to, I don't want to be on your team, basically. <laughs> I just don't. You're not you know? working for me. <laughs> it's not, it's not working. And so, you know, um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I wish I could have handled that a little bit better, but I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that's, so that's what happened. We're just about out of time in the entire show. Um, Darn it. But real quickly, I could go on and on. How would you, the world change if more of us could live from our hearts? You know, maybe there'd be more, maybe there would be a little bit more listening. Conflict res resolution would be not so much just from the head, but it might be from the heart. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the problems is, you know, when you, when you run into trouble, how do you, how do you, where do you, how do you solve it? You know, do you come from the heart and you, do you take the big hearted approach where you may have to admit you're wrong? Um, God forbid. God forbid um, that. Well, you know, um, unfortunately, you we are at the end of the show. Don, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge. Well, to thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and uh, I appreciate you, the work that you're doing, and thank, thank you. you. Our guest this hour has been Don Johnson, the author of Living a Conscious Life. To find out more about Don, where you can find his book and all he has to offer, visit his website, integrigroup.com. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit missionevolution.org. But please be sure to join us right here next time. This mission will continue, bringing information, resources, and support to an evolving world.